Well, we've lived here for about six months now. Um, I say that because Dassel Cocado High School has existed much longer than that. But um, I think that, you know, we moved here. My daughter joined the cheerleading team, and suddenly Dassel Cocado is a state champion. So I'll let you make your own connection there. <laughs> Some people think it's Eli Gilman. Really, I think it's Keeley. But, you know. We are just so thrilled. Um, it was such a great opportunity yesterday to be down at Viking Stadium and to celebrate a, a state championship. You know, as long as Dassel Cocado High School exists, this group of guys will be the first one to bring back a state championship. That's something that can never be taken away from them, and we were thrilled to celebrate with them. But this morning, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 47. So if you've got your copy of God's Word, I'll invite you to get that open with me right now. Isaiah chapter 47. I want to begin this morning by asking you a question. Uh, Be warned, most of you are going to get this question wrong. But I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you, as I ask the question, to look to the person sitting beside you and answer that question with them. Let's see if anyone happens to get this question right. Here's the question. What is the greatest Disney movie that was ever made? Okay, some, some of you are guessing away. Um, the, the objectively right answer, as determined by a committee of me, is Robin Hood. Robin Hood, of course, right? A a great, thrilling action adventure released in 1973. It's a beautiful riches to rags story. Now, I love it when a villain in the story gets exactly what's coming to them. So here's kind of what happens in Robin Hood. The movie begins with the main antagonist, Prince John, kind of counting his money and saying, taxes, taxes, beautiful taxes, And at that moment, anyone in the viewing audience who's over 18 immediately hates the dude. But he begins, this Prince John character does, extorting the people of Nottingham, collecting excess taxes to fund his lavish life of luxury, taxing them beyond the point of what they can pay. And so Robin Hood begins stealing back some of that excess tax money. And the movie continues to this peak showdown between Robin Hood and this villainous tiger dude. And then at the end of the movie, King Richard, the rightful ruler of the land, returns from warfare and sees what his evil villainous brother has been doing and sentences Prince John to go labor in the royal rock pile. And I love the ending of that movie because don't you love it? There's a real sense of justice when a person who deserves to get put in their place actually gets put in their place. And that, my friends, is what's happening in Scripture here in Isaiah chapter 47. God is putting Babylon in its place. That's why the title of today's message is Blasting Babylon. If you've been with us for the last several weeks or months, we've been walking through a series, preaching through Isaiah 40, and we're going to go through 55. That's kind of this middle second section of Isaiah. And what we've seen is that Babylon has taken God's people out of God's land, imprisoning them as exiles in Babylon. And now God is going to deal with Babylon. In Isaiah chapter 46, this was last week, Babylon's gods exited stage left, but Babylon's gods were really just representatives of Babylon's trust in themselves and the power of their nation. Babylon believed that the true power their gods represented was the power of Babylon. And so in order for God's plan for world history to happen, and not just Babylon's gods needed to be disposed, Babylon itself had to be dealt with, and Babylon itself had to be removed from power. That's what's happening in Isaiah chapter 47. Isaiah chapter 47 is a poem written as a word to Babylon, predicting the doom and the collapse of Babylon. Guys, this is a stunning word, predicting the doom and collapse of Babylon. Babylon was the greatest nation, the strongest world power in its generation, And so what would this be like in our day? What it would be like, um, if you think about it, I think there's kind of two major world superpowers on the scene right now. We live in one of them, right? The United States. And probably if you traveled across the Pacific Ocean, we would admit, well, the, the other big world superpower is China. 
And, and, and so if you said these two great military and economic forces were just going to be canceled, removed, dropped off the map tomorrow, no longer existing as nations, well, that's what it would be like to predict that Babylon would be no more. And that's what Isaiah was doing here in this passage. Babylon is going off the stage of history. Now, like the text in Isaiah chapter 45, remember our chapter 45 was addressed to Cyrus, but it's unlikely that Cyrus ever read Israel's scripture. I think we kind of have the same thing going on here. It's probably unlikely that the nation of Babylon ever read Israel's scriptures that we're talking about Babylon. So this was a text kind of addressed to Babylon in a literary sense, but in a literal sense, the text was probably written for God's people who are reading it. So written to Babylon, but written for or Israel, or all of God's people who would read it throughout the generations. Uh, God's people needed to know that God would rectify the mistreatment that had happened to them, and God would intervene and deal with the vengeance that needed to take place for them. And even more than that, I think God's people needed to be warned. See, Babylon was rich. Babylon was glitzy. Babylon was powerful. It would have been tempting for Israel to see what Babylon had and to want what Babylon had. And they might have thought about becoming like Babylon in character. They might have been tempted to adopt Babylon's values. And so this text is a warning. If you're tempted to adopt Babylon's values, look at what the destiny of Babylon is. All who adopt the values of Babylon will share in the fate of Babylon. And here, Isaiah says, is Babylon's fate. So let's uh, unpack Isaiah's poem about Babylon's fate or Babylon's destiny in three parts this morning. And the first thing that we see about Babylon is Babylon has no future. Here's the first five verses of chapter 47. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground without a throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For you shall no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind flour. Put off your veil, strip off your robe, uncover your legs, pass through the rivers. Your nakedness shall be uncovered and your disgrace shall be seen. I will take vengeance and I will spare no one. Our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, his name is the Holy One of Israel. Sit in silence and go into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you shall no more be called the mistress of kingdoms. That's a strong word. Now, interestingly, in that culture, it was common to address cities or nations, to personify them, to speak to them as young women. And so it was in keeping with the culture of that time that Babylon is addressed as a young female. And a couple observations I want you to see from these first five verses about Babylon's future. The uh, first of these two observations is Babylon is going from princess to slave. So all the imagery in this passage points to a riches to rags story. A couple things from these verses I want to point out. Uh, verse one, the princess has gone from sitting on a throne to sitting in a pile of dust. A pile of dust or a pile of dirt was symbolic of mourning or grieving or humiliation. And that's what's happening here in this passage. Not only is the princess sitting in dust, but the luxuries of life are lost. You see that where it says, you shall no longer be called tender and delicate. Can we talk for just a moment about hands? So uh, I work in an office primarily. I do people work. I have smooth office hands. My grandpa was a dairy farmer. He worked in the fields with hay and cows and barbed wire. And he had the cuts and calluses of a working hand. And do you see what's being said to Princess Babylon? You're not going to have your little soft, dainty hands anymore. You're going to have the hands of hard work, and that's going to be symbolized by your millstone hands. Verse 2, start working the millstone. So a millstone in, in that culture was a, a big rock in which you would place the corn or the wheat, and you would push the wheel that would mash what was in there, and out of that would come flour or cornmeal. And from there, you would make your bread or get your food. And so 
This was slave work. This was common laborer work. And so here was Babylon used to living a life of luxury, having someone else do all the hard work for them. And Isaiah said, you're not going to be able to rely on someone else to do your work any longer. You're going to have to do the hard work. The royal clothing is gone in verse 2. No more Saks Fifth Avenue, no more Louis Vuitton, no more Oscar de la Renta gowns. It's Goodwill and Walmart clothes from here on out. Now it said that uh, this, uh, strip off your robe, uncover your legs, pass through the rivers, and you're like, uh, what, what, what's that about? So this was actually another thing about the kind of work that the people of Babylon were going to have to do. So this is super interesting. Um, back in their culture, they didn't have washing machines. I know that's a huge revelation to you guys, but um, if they wanted to wash their clothes, because, you know, they kind of had the same problem we did. Like, if you wore the same shirt 10 days in a row, yeah. So, um, so, so they wanted to wash their clothes, right? But they didn't have anywhere to wash their clothes, so they, they found a place to wash their clothes, and that was the river. And so what they would do is uh, the, their women would hike up the garments of their skirt and they would take the clothes basket down to the river and they would drop the clothes in the water and then they would step on the clothes and push them under the water and hold them underwater for a period of time. And well, that was laundry. And, and you're like, that sounds like a really weird way of doing laundry. And I'm like, yo, people in our generation eat Tide Pods. So like, I'm not sure we've really advanced all that far. So here goes Babylon from luxury and people serving them to having to do their own work and living a life of hard labor. But probably the strongest thing that was spoken against them in verse 3, your nakedness shall be uncovered. That, of course, is a euphemistic way of saying that they will be vulnerable and exploited by cruel masters. The power that Babylon used to exploit others will be turned on them and used against them. Unfortunately, throughout world history, it's been a dominant pattern that those who had power over others would oftentimes use it to exploit vulnerable women. Tragically, our nation's history is not much different during the time of slavery in America. One of our dirty secrets was that masters would often use their slave girls for their own pleasure. There's actually a, a, a DNA test that came out in 1998 that tells a very sordid family secret. Maybe you heard about this. It was published back in 2000. There was a woman named Sally Hemings, and she, fa uh, she mothered six children. And it turned out that the father of her children, confirmed by DNA tests, was actually Thomas Jefferson. And so here was this sordid tale hidden for almost 200 years, confirmed through the DNA of living ancestors of both groups. What a horrible fall from grace for Babylon to go from being the exploiter to being exploited from the conqueror to the conquered. But why the note about vengeance and who God is in verse four? Well, that leads to the second of two observations I wanted to make when we talk about Babylon having no future. Uh, Babylon is going from princess to slave, but then why? The reason why is Babylon is getting the same treatment that she gave God's people. So what had Babylon done? Well, back in 586 BC, God used the nation of Babylon to conquer the southern kingdom of Israel, the nation of Judah, and the people of Judah, these Israelites, were hauled by Babylon into captivity. And what God is saying is, hey, Babylon, what you did now is going to be done to you. You're going to get the same thing you gave. It's a great reverse. What Israel experienced in 586 is now Babylon's fate. And we know that Babylon is experiencing Israel's fate because we have recorded for us in scripture what Israel's fate was. So after the uh, city of Jerusalem, the capital of Judah, this southern kingdom of Israel, after it fell, the prophet Jeremiah wrote a book lamenting the state of his homeland. And we know that in scripture as the book of Lamentations. And what I want you to see are five places in Lamentations where what happened to Israel 
is now happening to Babylon. And what we'll see is that these verses we just read have a parallel in what happened to Israel in 586 BC. So if you want to keep a thumb in Isaiah chapter 47 and flip with me to the book of Lamentations, let's see the five things that happened to Israel that are now going to happen to Babylon. Here's the first one. It's actually in the first verse of the first chapter of Lamentations. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow has she become, she who was great among the nations, she who was a princess among the provinces, has become a slave. Babylon is going from princess to slave, just as Israel went from princess to slave. This next, in Lamentations chapter 2, verse 10. The elders of the daughters of Zion sit on the ground in silence. They have thrown dust on their heads and put on sackcloth. The young women of Jerusalem have bowed their heads to the ground. Israel was stuck in mourning and humiliation. And now mourning and humiliation will be the lot of Babylon. Uh, next, let's go to Lamentations chapter 4. A couple verses. I want to start in verse 5. It says this, Those who once feasted on delicacies perish in the streets. Those who are brought up in purple, that was the color that royal garments were made of. Those who were brought up in purple embrace ash heaps. I'll skip to verse 7. Her princes were purer than snow, whiter than milk. Their bodies were more ruddy than coral. The beauty of their form was like sapphire. Now their face is blacker than soot. They're not recognized in the streets. Their skin is shriveled on their bones. It has become dry as wood. Uh, Lamentations 5 verse 3. We have become orphans, fatherless, our mothers are like widows. That's actually in verse 9 of chapter 47. We haven't quite gotten it there yet, but it says, uh, these two things shall come on you in a moment. The loss of children and widowhood shall come upon you in full measure. So do you see? Do you see? Everything that Babylon did to Israel is coming back on Babylon. And that worst thing we talked about in chapter 47, we'll look at Lamentations 5 verse 11. God's people experienced that as well. Women are raped in Zion, young women in the towns of Judah. Horrible. We'll let that speak for itself. You might be saying, okay, okay, okay. That's a lot. Isn't that kind of excess punishment? Isn't that a little bit too heavy? Well, that leads to Isaiah's second point. Not only does Babylon have no future, but Babylon has no excuses and so the next five verses are going to explain why this is right for this to happen to Babylon. Verse 6 of Isaiah chapter 47. I was angry with my people. I profaned my heritage. I gave them into your hand. You showed them no mercy on the aged. You have made your yoke exceedingly heavy. Well, we'll, we'll pause right there. Here's the first thing God says as to why Babylon has no excuse. He says this is fair recompense. No mercy is shown on Babylon for the no mercy that they showed to God's people. Uh, specifically in the text, they showed no mercy in how they treated elderly captives. Uh, so one, one commentator, I was studying this week, one commentator on Isaiah was trying to say, well, you know, Babylon didn't really treat their captives any more cruelly than other tyrants of that generation. And I'm sitting there thinking, that's not a high bar. See, see, here's what Babylon did to their captives, especially to old people. Uh, so, so, so nose piercing actually didn't start at Claire's in 1997. It, 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 just, just, uh, it started back with Babylon. And so what they would do when they conquered a nation is they would kind of do the double pierce through the bridge of your nose and they would insert this big loop hook ring and they would line all the captives up with the loop hook ring and they would feed a piece of rope through each ring. And as they were dragging the people off into exile, they would kind of play tug a captive. And can you just imagine if you were old and aged and couldn't keep up? How horrible that must be. No mercy shown to those who had shown no mercy. Hard labor was the lot of those who made it to Babylon. Perhaps Babylon would have objected Again, this wasn't written to Babylon, but this was 
spoken in a way as though ostensibly it was written to Babylon. God's people would have understood the words that could have been placed on Babylon's lips because they knew from their own prophetic scriptures that God had used Babylon, that their prophets had predicted that God would use Babylon. So can't you see a Babylon objecting, God, we just did what your prophet said we were supposed to do. You predicted that you would raise us up to deal with your people, to punish them for their sins, So we just did what we were supposed to do. And the answer God would give them back is yes, but you didn't have to enjoy taking the cruelty to overkill. You could have shown mercy, even though mercy wasn't in style with the other tyrants and conquerors of your generation. There's no excuse because you showed no mercy. But I think there was an even bigger problem. The reason Babylon didn't show mercy The reason Babylon didn't show mercy is because they didn't think they had to give an answer for how they acted to anyone. And that was the problem of pride. Listen to these next few verses. Verse seven, you said, I shall be mistress forever. So you did not lay these things to heart or remember their end. Now, therefore, hear this, you lover of pleasures who sit securely, who say in your heart, I am and there is no one beside me. I shall not sit as a widow or know the loss of children. These two things shall come on you in a moment in one day. The loss of children and widowhood shall come upon you in full measure. In spite of your many sorceries and the great power of your enchantments, you felt secure in your wickedness. You said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and your knowledge led you astray. And you said in your heart, I am, and there is no one besides me. I want you to see the pride in three ways in these passages. In verse seven, notice what Babylon said. I will exist forever. I shall be. Now, that's interesting. I don't know if you remember sixth grade English super well, but I shall be is a form of the verb I am. That's God language. God introduced himself, I am who I am, and I shall be who I shall be. God is the only self-defined one. God is the only eternally existing one. And Babylon took the language of God and applied it to themselves. And the second verse that I want to point out to you, verse 8, notice what Babylon said, I am, and there is no one beside me. I mean, just flip back to Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45, verses five and six. Listen to what God says. I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I am and there is no one besides me, Babylon says. I am the Lord and there is no other. There is none besides me, God says. Do you see what Babylon is doing? Babylon is usurping the place of God. And they usurp the place of God most clearly in claiming that they have no accountability. Verse 10, you said, no one sees me. You know, this is the great daydream of every 12-year-old who's trying to do whatever they want. But the point of the passage is this. Babylon is saying, there's no one to look over my shoulder and tell me that what I'm doing is wrong. There's no one who has power over me to tell me that I can't do what I want to do. What's the point? What's the point? The point is Babylon is saying, I determine what's right and wrong. I determine what I can do and what I can't do. God says, you have some rules you have to follow. And Babylon says, there's nobody to keep me accountable because I'm going to do what I want to do. And anybody that wants to hold me account better come with the big sword and the big stick. And they're not going to get very successful because we're stronger and we're bigger and we've been around longer. Do you see how Babylon is trying to usurp the place of God? It's an attitude that says, you can't question me. You can't challenge me. But remember this, though the text was on the surface written to Babylon, it was actually written for God's people. Because friends, you see, Babylon wasn't just an ancient city that was the capital of an ancient empire. Babylon throughout scripture is the biblical symbol for all self-trusting, all self-loving, all self-exalting civilizations and people throughout history. And Babylon's worldview has infected so many hearts. Babylon's worldview says, 
You do you. I'll do me. Babylon's worldview says, I'll do what I want. You can't tell me what to do. Throughout every generation, the celebration of self and assertion of self power springs up anew. It's as old as Babylon, but it recurs in every time. Consider, will you, this poem that you might have studied in school that celebrates self power, self assertion. Have you heard of this poem, Invictus, by William Ernest Henley? It's just four short stanzas. Listen to what it says. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid." It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And God is warning his people. If you're tempted to look like Babylon and be like Babylon and want to worship yourself like Babylon, consider the outcome of Babylon. And it says right here, in one day. In one day, Babylon will fall, and that's exactly what happened because as Babylon sat trusting themselves, Cyrus came from Persia and stormed through the known world and so fed up with the people of Babylon, with the tyrants who ruled them, that they flung wide the gates of the city and Cyrus marched right in and the greatest empire the world had ever known fell with a whimper. In one day, they were done. And God was saying, such is the destiny of all who think they are unconquerable, such as the destiny of all who think that their human pride and self-assertion will carry the day. And one day the Lord Jesus will return and all Babylons will be destroyed. See, there was a Babylon that was a city, but there is a Babylon that is a spiritual reality. The heart of Babylon, this self-pride and self-exaltation. And what is the end of this spiritual Babylon. Well, the New Testament tells us in the book of Revelation. John tells us in Revelation chapter 18, speaking of Babylon, the full and final Babylon, for her sins are heaped as high as heaven and God has remembered her iniquities, pay her back as she herself has paid back others and repay her double for her deeds, mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning. Since in her heart she says, I sit as a queen, I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. For this reason her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire, for mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. And you see the words from Isaiah 47 repeated almost verbatim in Revelation chapter 18. What happened to the ancient city of Babylon will happen to everyone who has the heart of Babylon. And what does it say in Revelation chapter 18? Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. And the whole chapter kicks off with a voice from heaven saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. All who trust in themselves will experience what happened to Babylon. Every Babylon is defined by pride and every Babylon will fall. So what is the message for God's people? The message for God's people is found in Revelation chapter 18, verse 4. Come out, a voice from heaven said. Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. Babylon's doom is sure, so come out of Babylon, the text says. Here's the thing. God promised that he was going to get his people out of Babylon. He was going to return them to their homeland to the city of Jerusalem, God's city. But even though God promised to get his people out of Babylon, he now needed to get Babylon out of his people. Because within so many of us is a heart that says, I'll do it my way. Within so many of us is a heart that says, I don't have to answer to anyone. 
within so many of us is a heart that says, I am in control. Babylon says, I'll exist forever. Friends, you can work out. You can try to stop the spread of COVID-19. You can look to find cures for various forms of cancer. We should do all those things. But each and every one of us one day is still going to die unless Jesus Christ returns in our lifetime. And there's something really honest and really freeing about saying, I'm going to die. Because Babylon says, I am and I will be. And reality says, one day you will be in a box. And the only hope you have is that there's resurrection beyond the grave. There's got to be something stronger than the self-will of Babylon. Babylon says, I'll never suffer. You can save money. You can get a PhD. You can live in a nice community. You can even eat kale. I don't know why you'd do that, but you could. There's no guarantees. You can serve God with your life. I knew a young girl at Moody. She graduated with me. She was preparing to go serve God as a missionary in Kyrgyzstan. She was in language school. And before she was 30 years old, she felt a lump in her breast. It was aggressive and she was gone within the year. You can have everything this world offers and says that you need. And Kobe Bryant died in a helicopter crash. Man, you can do anything and say, I'm doing this so that I can guarantee that life will end this way. And the only guarantee you have is that life will end. Babylon says, I'm going to decide what's right for me. You can Frank Sinatra did it my way throughout life. But hear this, accountability delayed is not accountability denied. And the honest question we must be asking is this, is there actually a God to whom I'm accountable? Babylon says no. Isaiah says yes. Is there a God to whom I'm accountable? It makes all the difference. If there's no God to whom you're accountable, then go ahead and be like Babylon. But if there is a God to whom you're accountable, you need to get the Babylon out of your hearts. And so how do we answer the question when Babylon screams through our culture all around us, there is no one to whom you're accountable. And Isaiah says there is. Isaiah says, look to history. And the Babylon of history that sat on the banks of the Tigris River in ancient Mesopotamia that said you are accountable to no one. Isaiah says, look at that city. And it's now but a pile of archaeological rubble. And you ask yourself, who do you want to believe? Babylon, which has fallen, or God, whose word stands the test of time? No future for Babylon. No excuse for Babylon. One last point. There's no escape. Listen to these last verses. But evil shall come upon you, which you will not know how to charm away. Disaster shall fall upon you, for which you will not be able to atone. And ruin shall come upon you suddenly, of which you know nothing. Stand fast in your enchantments and your many sorceries with which you have labored from your youth. Perhaps you may be able to succeed. Perhaps you may inspire terror. You are wearied with your many counsels. Let them stand forth and save you. Those who divide the heavens, who gaze at the stars, who at the new moons make known what shall come upon you, behold, they are like stubble. The fire consumes them. They can't deliver themselves from the power of the flames. No coal for warming oneself is this. No fire to sit before. Such to you are those with whom you have labored, who have done business with you from your youth. They wander about, each in his own direction. There's no one to save you. There's no escape and yet Babylon tried to escape. We see in this text three ways Babylon tried to escape from the collapse that was coming on them through Persia. Uh, three ways we see Babylon trying to escape. Here's the first one. They tried to escape through astrology. So the ancient Babylonians thought that they could just kind of telescope up and see the stars and this star's here and this star's there. And because of how the stars are moving, this is what's going to happen in the future. And y'all, that's about as hokey and as pointless as the horoscopes that you see in the daily newspaper. Astrology didn't work for them. Uh, how, how about sorcery? So, so Babylon kind of had this like voodoo style thing that they did. Um, when they were getting ready to go into military battle, they'd take some uh, ceramic or some porcelain, some glass, uh, so, some type of breakable material, and they would fashion a little figurine of their enemy nation. And then they would take a hammer and they would just kind of smash it in a religious ceremony. And they're like, look, we just kind of like voodooed the other nation. And I love Isaiah in verse 12. 
so, so this is Isaiah at his finest. He just goes like full captain sarcasm on him. So, so, so check out again what he says in verse 12. This, this is amazing. He goes, stand fast in your enchantments and your sorceries. What he's saying is, uh, go try it, y'all. Just, just, just give, it your, give it your best shot. Perhaps you might succeed. Perhaps you might inspire terror. I love that. Here, here's Isaiah. Y'all go give it your best shot. It just might work out for you this time. Maybe this is the time it's going to work. Maybe this time it'll actually happen. Narrator voice, it's not working. Duh. Then the last thing Babylon tried, and I love this, they tried to charm their way out of it. Now, did, did you know somebody that you grew up with in school that could just kind of like Ferris Bueller talk their way out of anything? And, and no matter what happened, they just kind of had an excuse for it. And they're just like, you know, smooth talking people. And so you, the, the teacher's like, hey, you shouldn't do that. And the, the kid's just like, you know, you're like, oh, wipe that off your nose. Like, you know, you're just like, you're, you're such a smooth talker. They go to the principal's office and you're like, you finally got nailed. And they're like, I didn't get nailed. I talked my way right out of this one. And God's like, y'all ain't talking your way out of this one. Because there comes a time when your astrology and your sorcery and your charms are going to fail. Why? Because there's a fire that's coming upon you. That's what it says in verse 14 and 15. And I love what it says. No coal for warming oneself is this. He's like, a, there's a fire coming, but this isn't like a campfire that y'all sit around and uh, roast s'mores together. Like this is a roasting conflagration and it's coming to destroy. It's coming to burn. And the people that you thought you would band together with through your own self-effort and self-pride, and we're just going to keep doing business together, and we're just going to keep ourselves secure, and we're just going to keep ourselves in luxuries, like all these people that you thought you were together with, doing all this cool stuff with, it's like you're all going to flee for your lives. And this human effort to come together, God is going to drive everybody apart, and everybody's going to flee and you could say it this way, Babylon chose to live like trash. And so God's getting ready to trash Babylon. No escape, just fleeing for your lives. And by the way, in the full and final judgment that's coming on the spirit of Babylon in Revelation chapter 18, it says when the final fire comes, there is no escape. But hear this, friends. There is a note of hope in this passage. Because we live between the time when Babylon was judged by Cyrus, when the city of Babylon fell, and when the spirit of Babylon, the spiritual Babylon that says, I can do things my way, I don't need God, I'm self-reliant, I can exalt myself, I can worship myself. We live between the times when the city fell and when the spirit of Babylon will fall. And in between the times, there's a little note of hope. Back in verse five, it said this, sit in silence and go into darkness. Now, going into darkness usually isn't a very great idea. When I was a child, my family took a tour of Mammoth Caves in Kentucky, and it was a beautiful tour. We got to walk through the caves, and there were all these underground rock formations, and I got to learn what a stalactite and a stalagmite were, and they were really almost crystal-looking things to gaze at. It was beautiful. But then the tour guide, as we were getting ready to end the tour, said, well, now I'm going to turn off the lights in this underground cave, and you're going to see what total pitch darkness is like. And here I was, 10 years old. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're good. We're good. He's like, click. And there goes the lights. And I mean, this was a darkness you could feel. You couldn't see a thing. And this was, this was before we all had cell phones, so nobody could kind of whip out their little cell phone flashlight. I mean, it was pitch black. But hear this. When you sit in darkness, you can see the tiniest speck of light. And maybe the reason God was sending Babylon into darkness is because Babylon needed to see the light. See, there was one last prophecy I want to show you. It was a prophecy originally given to two out-of-the-way places called Zebulun and Naphtali. But I think that the prophecy is now applying to Babylon, who's sitting in darkness as well. And in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, it says this, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness... On them, light has shone. The deeper the darkness, the brighter the light. And one day, a couple thousand years ago, 
in a time of deep spiritual darkness, the light of heaven came down and was born in a manger. And the light of the world dawned in the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ came to those who couldn't see their way past their Babylon self-sufficient hearts. And Jesus said, I have come to do another great reversal. You've tried to live as a princess and you've been made a slave, but I lived as the prince of heaven and I have come not to serve, not to be served, but to serve, to be a slave so that I can take your Babylon hearts and drag them to the cross. And when I take your Babylon hearts to the cross, I'm gonna replace them with new hearts that are pure and righteous and that are fit to live forever. To those who had Babylon hearts that said, I am great, I am strong, I am self-reliant, the cross screams, you can be Christ-reliant. And if you're Christ-reliant, all the promises of heaven can be gifted to you. And so this is the question, isn't it? The question we each must face. What kind of heart do I have? Do I have a Babylon heart? Or do I have a cross heart? We're going to close our service this morning by celebrating communion together. What I love about communion is communion is a time to remember what Jesus has done for us on the cross. But communion is also a time to make a declaration. And the declaration we make in communion is this. I need Jesus to live in me. And so when we take the body and the blood of Jesus, what we're actually saying is, I need Jesus to be my all in all. And so I need not me any longer, but I need him in place of me. And so for those of us who have known Jesus for many years. Communion is a time to say, Lord, I thank you that you've given me a new heart that's dependent on nothing I bring, but dependent only on what you give. Maybe this morning you're in church and you've never had that moment where you've said, Lord Jesus, I belong to you, where you've said, I want what you've done on the cross to apply to me. The beauty of the cross is that you can come to Jesus and you can say, Lord Jesus, I give you my heart. I give you my life. And I want what you've done on the cross to be mine. I can't rely on myself to live forever past the grave. I can't rely on myself to do what's right. But you can change me and you can live in my heart and in my place. So maybe this morning you just want to pray that simple prayer, Lord Jesus, I give myself to you. Come and live in me. We're going to give you a moment to reflect, to ask the Lord to come, do his work inside of you as we sing the first verse of this song, Sing to Jesus. I love the chorus of this song, Sing to Jesus, Lord of our shame because he takes our shame, our Babylon shameful hearts and trades them out with his goodness. And in place of our shame, he gives us his glory. So would you listen and let the Lord speak to you through the words of this song.